Felix Nunez, a Mexican soldier who took part in the siege, reported this. Each and everything pertaining to the final assault underwent the personal supervision of General Santa Anna to the end that it would be successful. Three of his most experienced officers were selected to assist him in commanding the assaulting parties. General Vicente Felizola, his second in command with a thousand picked men, took charge of the assault on the east of the Alamo. General Castrolor, with a like number, was placed on the south side. General Ramirez Sesma was to have taken command on the west side next to the river, but seeing President Santa Anna was determined to make the final assault the next day, feigned sickness, and was put under arrest and started back to the capital. This part of the command was devolved on General Vol, so there was no General Sesma in command of any portion of the army at the fall of the Alamo. The troops on the north and northwest, 1,500 in number, were commanded by General Santa Anna in person. This made 4,500 men who participated in the engagement. In addition to this, there was a fatigue party well supplied with ladders, crowbars, and axes for the purpose of making breaches in the walls or at other valuable points. The infantry were formed nearest the Alamo as we made the least noise. The cavalry was formed around the outside of the Alamo with special orders from all the commanders to cut down everyone who dared to turn back. Everything being in readiness just as dawn of the day on the 6th of March and the fourth day of the siege, all bugles sounded a charge from all points. At this time, our cannon had battered down nearly all the walls that enclosed the church. Consequently, all the Americans had taken refuge inside the church, and the front door of the main entrance fronting to the west was open. Just outside of this door, Colonel Travis was working his cannon. The division of our army on the west side was the first to open fire. They fired from the bed of the river near where the opera house now stands. The first fire from the cannon of the Alamo passed over our heads and did no harm. But as the troops were advancing, the second one opened a lane in our lines at least 50 feet broad. Our troops rallied and returned a terrible fire of cannon and small arms. After this, the cannonading from the Alamo was heard no more. It's evident that this discharge killed Travis, for then the front door was closed and no more Americans were seen outside. By this time, the courtyard, the doors, the windows, roof, and all around the doomed Alamo became one reeking mass of armed humanity. Each one of us vied with the other for the honor of entering the Alamo first. Just at sunrise, a lone marksman appeared on top of the church and fired. A colonel was struck in the neck by the shot and died at sundown. This, the officers, took as evidence that the Americans had opened a hole in the roof themselves. This proved to be true, for almost in the next moment, another American appeared on top of the roof with a little boy in his arms, apparently about three years old, and attempted to jump off, but they were immediately riddled with bullets and both fell lifeless to the ground. With this, the troops pressed on, receiving a deadly fire from the top of the roof. When it was discovered that the Americans had constructed a curious kind of ladder or gangway of long poles tied together with ropes and filled up on top with sticks and dirt. This reached from the floor on the inside of the church to over the top edge of the wall to the ground on the outside. As soon as this discovery was made, Santa Anna ordered his entire division to charge and make for the gangway and hole in the roof. But most of the soldiers who showed themselves at this place got not into the Alamo, but into another world, for nearly every one of them was killed. When they found out that all the Americans were alive inside the church, during the siege upon this time we had not killed even a single one except Colonel Travis and the man and boy referred to, for afterwards there were no new graves nor dead bodies in an advanced state of decomposition discovered. By the time the front door was battered down and the conflict had become general, the entire army came pouring in from all sides, and never in all my life did I witness or hear such a hand-to-hand -hand conflict. The Americans fought with the bravery and desperation of tigers, although seeing that they were contending against the fearful odds of at least 200 to 1, not one single one of them tried to escape or ask for quarter, the last one fighting with as much bravery and animation as the first. None of them hid in rooms nor asked for quarter, for they knew none would be given. On the contrary, they all died like heroes, selling their lives as dear as possible. There was but one man killed in a room, and this was a sick man in the big room on the left of the main entrance. He was bayoneted in his bed. He died apparently without shedding a drop of blood. The last moments of the conflict conflict became terrible in the extreme. The soldiers in the moments of victory became entirely uncontrollable, and owing to the darkness of the building and the smoke of the battle, fell to killing one another, not being able to distinguish friend from foe. General Filosola was the first one to make this discovery. He reported to General Santa Anna, who once mounted the walls, although the voice of our idolized commander could scarcely be heard above the din and roar of battle. His presence, together with the majestic waving of his sword, sufficed to stop the bloody carnage. But not until all the buglers entered the church and sounded a retreat did all the horrible butchery entirely cease. To recount the individual deeds of valor of the brave men who were slain in the Alamo would fill a volume as large as the history of Texas. Nevertheless, there was one who perished in that memorable conflict who is entitled to a passing notice. The one to whom I referred was killed just inside the front door. The peculiarity of his dress and undaunted courage attracted the attention of several of us, both officers and men. 
He was a tall American of rather dark complexion and had a long buckskin coat and a round cap without any bill and made of fox skin with a long tail hanging down his back. This man apparently had a charmed life. Of the many soldiers who took deliberate aim at him and fired, not one ever hit him. On the contrary, he never missed a shot. Jose Enrique de la Peña, a lieutenant colonel in Santa Ana's army, wrote, The column of soldiers bravely storming the fort in the midst of a terrible shower of bullets and cannon fire had reached the base of the walls. Our soldiers, some stimulated by courage and others by fury, burst into the quarters where the enemy had entrenched themselves, from which issued an infernal fire. Behind these came others who, nearing the doors and blind with fury and smoke, fired their shots against friends and enemies alike, and in this way our losses were most grievous. On the other hand, they turned the can uh, enemy's own cannon to bring down the doors to the rooms or the rooms themselves. A horrible carnage took place, and some were trapped to death. The tumult was great, the disorder frightful. It seemed as if the furies had descended upon us. De La Pena's testimony gave the lie to a favorite myth, that Davy Crockett died in the baptistry of the Alamo, and was found there, according to a plaque at the site, with dead Mexicans piled about him, whom he'd slain before giving up his life. On the contrary, according to De La Pena, and other soldiers backed this story, some seven men had survived the general carnage, and they were brought before Santa Anna. Among them was the naturalist Davy Crockett. Santa Anna ordered his execution. Though tortured before they were killed, these unfortunates died without complaining and without humiliating themselves. From another member of Santa Anna's army came this report. On this same evening, a little before nightfall, it's been said that Barrett Travis, commander of the enemy, had offered to the general-in-chief by a woman messenger to surrender his arms and the fort with all the materials upon the sole condition that his own life and the lives of his men would be spared. But the answer was that they must surrender at discretion, without any guarantee, even of life, which traitors did not deserve. It's evident that after such an answer, they all prepared to sell their lives as dearly as possible. Consequently, they exercised the greatest vigilant day and night to avoid surprise. On the morning of March 6th, the Mexican troops were stationed at 4 o'clock a.m. accordance to Santa Ana's instructions. The artillery, as appears from these same instructions, was to remain inactive, as it received no order, and furthermore, darkness and the disposition made the troops which were to attack the four fronts at the same time, prevented its firing without mowing down our own ranks. Thus, the enemy was not to suffer from artillery during the attack. Their own artillery was in readiness, and at the sight and sound of the bugle, they could no longer doubt that the time had come for them to conquer or die. Had they still doubted, the impudent shouts for Santa Anna, given by our own columns of attack, must have opened their eyes. As soon as our troops were in sight, a shower of grape and musket balls was poured upon them from the fort, the garrison of which at the sound of the bugle had rushed to arms and to their posts. The three columns that attacked the west, the north, and the east fell back, or rather wavered at the first discharge from the enemy. But the example and the efforts of the officer soon caused them to return to the attack. The columns of the western and eastern attacks, meeting with some difficulties in reaching the tops of the small houses which formed the walls of the fort, did, by a simultaneously movement to the right and left, swing northward, till the three columns formed one dense mass, which under the guidance of their officers endeavored to climb the parapet or on that side. This obstacle was at length overcome, the gallant General Juan V. Amador being among the foremost. Meantime, the columns attacked the southern front under Colonels Jose Vicente Menon and Jose Morales, availing themselves of a shelter formed by some stone houses near the western salient of that front, boldly took the guns defending it, and penetrated through the embrasures into the square formed by the barracks. There they assisted General Amador, who, having captured the enemy's pieces, turned them against the doors of the interior houses, where the rebels had sought shelter, and from which they fired upon our men in the act of jumping down on the square or court of the fort. At last, they were all destroyed by grape, musket shot, and the bayonet. Our loss was very heavy. Colonel Francisco Duque was mortally wounded at the very beginning. As he lay dying on the ground, where he was being trampled by his own men, he still ordered them all on to the slaughter. This attack was extremely injudicious and in opposition to military rules, for our own men were exposed not only to the fire of the enemy, but also to that of our own columns attacking the other fronts. And our soldiers, being formed in close columns, all shots that were aimed too low struck the backs of our foremost men. The greatest number of our casualties took part in that manner. It may even be affirmed that not one-fourth of our wounded were struck by the enemy's fire, because their cannon, owing to its elevated position, could not be sufficiently lowered to injure our troops after they'd reached the foot of the walls. Nor could the defenders use their muskets with accuracy, because the walls, having no inner banquet, they had in order to deliver the fire to stand on top, where they could not live one second. The official list of casualties made by General Juan de Andrade shows eight officers killed, 18 wounded, 
52 enlisted men killed, 233 wounded, total 311 killed and wounded. A great many of the wounded died for want of medical attention, beds, shelter, and surgical instruments. The whole garrison was killed except an old woman and a Negro slave, for whom the soldiers felt compassion, knowing that they had remained for compulsion alone. There were 150 volunteers, 32 citizens of Gonzales, who had introduced themselves into the fort for the night previous to the storming, and about 20 citizens or merchants of Bayer. So quick warning here. When I present the rules, I'll kind of present an overview to give you a good idea of how the game functions. I will probably not include a number of the minor rules that a uh, <clears throat> more capable player than me would find useful. So what I'm trying to say here is I probably won't be following the rules quite as written. Blood of Noble Men, the Alamo, was published in 2006 by Worthington Games and it was designed by Dennis Bishop. So let's go through the rules a little bit here. Uh, the game board contains a turn track, a victory point track, and a track for Mexican and Texian losses. It's set up in zones that control movement and combat, and the lettered zones outlined in white represent the Alamo compound, and the zones outside the Alamo compound are numbered and outlined in brown. Remember that no Texian unit can move outside of the compound, that is, into the lettered zones. Now, zones 8 and 9 are rough terrain that limit movement into the zone. The Alamo compound itself consists of wall zones and court zones that regulate movement and combat. Zones J, K, L, and M are courtyard zones. Zones A, that's the chapel, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I are wall zones, and certain wall zones have buildings with them. For instance, zone A, which is the chapel, and then B, D, E, F, G, and H. Any wall zone with an arrow pointing to it basically has a building in it, and entry into or out of the building is from or to a zone with a red arrow. So in order to enter these buildings, you have to move through the red arrow. Now game units can either be on the wall zone or inside the building of the wall zone. So think of it as your house. You can either be on the roof of your house or inside the house. And the Alamo Chapel Zone A is a unique wall zone that units treat as a combined wall and building. Now units in zone A are both on and inside the zone at the same time. Basically the roof of the Alamo had been removed and this giant ramp had been put inside of it. So if you visit the Alamo today what you're seeing inside this building is absolutely nothing like it would have looked at the time of the battle. Just take the roof off and fill it full of dirt and wood. Now only eight strength points and one artillery unit can be in zone A and it cannot be scaled by the Mexican player or fired on by infantry, particularly those that are outside of the Alamo compound. If the Mexicans capture artillery, they can fire with that artillery on Zone A. Also remember that movement into or out of Zone A has to be through an entry arrow in Zone J, and melee into Zone A can only be through Zone J. However, units in Zone A can conduct artillery and infantry fire outwards as though they were on a wall. Several types of game units in the game. The Texian units are all gray blocks with infantry, artillery, cannon crews, and leaders. And each type of unit can perform different functions. Infantry can move one zone per turn, and they can conduct fire and melee combat if they're attacked by Mexican units. Artillery can only be fired, reloaded, or moved by cannon crew units or Mexican infantry with a leader. Now, artillery has no strength points, and only one artillery unit can be located within a zone, with the exception of Zone H, that's that lunette zone, and here you can place two artillery units. Now, artillery units cannot be used inside buildings, with the exception of Zone A, that's the chapel. Also, artillery alone cannot defend in any zone or stop Mexican movement or scaling attempts. Now, cannon crews are these Texian units, and they can only reload, move, and fire artillery. Cannon crews also can perform as infantry units when they're not performing a function with an artillery unit, for instance, movement and fire of that gun. All cannon crews have one strength point, and movement rate for them is one zone per turn. Finally, Texian leaders are William Travis and Davy Crockett. They ignore buoy in this game. And leaders move two zones per turn. And leaders can provide leader bonus movement for units. Uh, they can also rally them. Each Texian leader unit is one strength point, and it performs as infantry for combat purposes. Now, the Mexican player controls all the blue units, and these consist of only two types of units, infantry and leaders. And each type of unit can perform different functions. Mexican infantry can move one zone per turn, and the infantry units can conduct fire and melee combat and scale walls. Any Mexican infantry unit with a leader can perform as a cannon crew. 
The Mexican army was divided into five columns for the assault, and each column is identified by a specific color in the center square. The individual units are also further identified by their name. Leaders represent the commanders of the Mexican assault columns, and leaders move two zones per turn. Leaders can provide leader bonus movement for units, and each Mexican leader can rally one strength point per turn for units in their column. Also remember, no more than two Mexican leaders can be in one zone at the same time. And also, leaders have no strength points. So setup for the Mexican player starts with determining where the columns are going to come in. Now there's five of them, and the player places the columns in the uh, zone that they wish. Now, no more than two columns can enter into one zone. The reserve column under a mot will come in a little later in the game when we bring in reserves. And at the beginning of the game, the Mexican player will determine which zone a mot will come in on. The Texian player then places each of their artillery units on the board in their correct starting position, and each artillery unit has its starting zone listed on the units and starts the game fully loaded. The Texian player then sets up the remainder of his units in any Alamo letter zone that they desire. And when the Mexican player places their units, that is considered the movement for their first turn. So then the Texian player will go, and then you'll go into regular sequence of play. Now I've changed the sequence of play up just a little bit from how the rules are written, from an I go, you go sort of system with the Mexican players going first and then the Texian players. The first step is the Mexican players will move, and if the Mexican player unit is adjacent to a wall, they can try to scale it. Next, the Mexican player can conduct any fire combat, and they do this first with captured artillery, then with any units that are not scaling a wall. Then the Texian players go and do the same thing. They move, and then they can conduct fire combat, first with artillery again, and then with infantry. Then a melee phase occurs, and the mandatory melee is resolved first, and that's when two, that's when enemy units are that's when both sides are in the same zone, and this is followed by optional melee, and that is if the Mexican units are in a zone adjacent to the Texian units. And melee results are resolved simultaneously for both sides. This is followed by a rally phase where leaders for both sides can rally one strength point for a unit that's stacked with them. On phase 7, you'll remove any arrow markers that have been on the artillery units that round, and this indicates that the artillery piece is now fully loaded. You then remove the fired marker from all artillery pieces that have been fired that round and replace that with an arrow marker to indicate that the cannon crew is in the process of loading that artillery piece. Phase 9 involves adjusting the victory point markers on the victory point track based on locations that have been taken by the Mexican player. And finally, on phase 10, if all the Texian units have been eliminated or it's the end of game turn 15, the game is over and the players determine victory. Uh, otherwise, you advance the game turn marker one space. Also note that um, starting with turn 3 of the game, the Mexican player will roll one die to determine if his reserve column appears on the board that turn. And once the reserve appears, there's no further rolls. Now each infantry or cannon crew unit is allowed to move one zone per turn and movement is from zone to adjacent connected zone. Also note, in this game, diagonal movement is not allowed. Now, leaders and units that are using the leader bonus move may move two zones per turn. Infantry units, cannon crews, and Texian leaders may move, fire, and melee during a single game turn. Now, Mexican units can enter zones containing only Texian artillery units, in which case the Mexican player is in control of that specific artillery unit. Now, zones 8 and 9, the rough terrain restrict Mexican movement. The Mexican player may not use double movement through these zones, and only 20 strength points per turn may enter these zones. Now, these restrictions do not apply to the number of units or strength points allowed to be in that zone or to exit that zone. As I mentioned a little bit before, there is a leader movement bonus. Now, each Texian leader can move themselves and up to five strength points two zones during their movement phase. Cannon crew units moving artillery units may not use this bonus, but cannon crews without artillery can. Each Mexican leader can move themselves and up to ten strength points two zones during their movement turn. Now, Mexican infantry with leaders moving artillery units cannot use this bonus. And also, Mexican units can't use this bonus to move through the rough terrain in zones eight and nine. Also, as I mentioned above, Texian units can't move outside the Alamo. Now, any wall zone with an arrow pointing to it has a building associated with it, and movement to these buildings is through the red arrows. Wall zones that have buildings also have a unique feature in that game units may either be on the wall zone or inside the building of the wall zone. Once you're inside of a building, a unit's only allowed to exit the building through the red arrow, and units on a wall zone can freely move to adjacent wall zones. 
but movement's not allowed from inside of a building to the inside of a different zone that's within a building. There's, there's interior walls between those zones. Also note that only eight strength points may be located inside a building or melee from the outside to the inside of a building. Now artillery units can never move or fire by themselves. The artillery units can only be moved or fired by Texian cannon crew units or Mexican infantry units that are accompanied by a leader unit. I'll probably say that several times. Artillery can only be moved during the movement portion of the owning player's turn. And artillery units can never fire at the same turn that they move. However, if an artillery unit has previously been loaded and say the uh, Mexican units capture it, they can fire at that turn. Now this is a little bit different than the rules in the game, but I say that units can enter a zone occupied by an enemy unit. However, they have to stop and engage in melee combat that round. If they start movement in a zone occupied by an enemy movement, and they cannot fire upon enemy units in that same zone. Now if they start movement in a zone occupied by an enemy unit, they can move out of that zone. And units do not have to stop movement if they move into a zone adjacent to an enemy unit. In other words, units don't exert zones of control on surrounding zones in this particular game. Now only Mexican units can scale walls, and if a Mexican unit is in a zone outside of the Alamo that's adjacent to a wall, and they have a commanding leader with them, then they can attempt to scale that wall. Now they have to start their movement phase in that adjacent zone. And up to seven units can attempt to scale a wall section. To determine the success of this, you count the units that are attempting to scale, and leaders don't count in this determination. And you roll one dice if a Texian unit's on the wall in that zone. Uh, you roll two dice if there's no enemy or Texian units on that wall. You then consult the wall scaling table, which will tell you how many units succeeded in scaling the wall. Now, as long as the leader stays in the zone adjacent to the wall, more units under that leader can attempt to scale the wall. Now, also note that a leader present in the zone that successfully scaled a wall can move up and down that wall freely during their movement phase. And this is not counted in the total number of units that can scale. Now, note that scaling the wall counts as full movement, and any units that scale the wall cannot join in fire combat that turn. However, they can melee. Any units that are unsuccessful in scaling the wall are free to engage in fire combat that turn. Also note that artillery units by themselves don't defend walls and that the inner side of the exterior walls of the Alamo are fitted with ramps and stairs and ladders so that walls don't have to be scaled from the courtyard. Finally, note that the uh, chapel cannot be scaled. It's too high. Now, there's two types of combat in the game, fire combat and melee combat. And fire combat involves... And fire combat involves units firing on other units, and those units will then take losses, which are shown by reducing their strength points. And to reduce strength in points, you rotate the block of the unit to account for the specific losses. And each player is free to choose which units that they wish to take losses from if more than one are in a zone. At times the Mexican player might occur losses higher than the actual losses that were accrued in the combat. For example, if a Mexican unit that had a 7, 5, 3, 1 strength point breakdown was in a zone by itself at full strength, that is seven strength points, and it took one strength point in losses, it would ultimately take a two strength point loss in order to rotate the unit one rotation. Now while both artillery and infantry can engage in fire combat, line of sight and range rules must be observed when you're firing on an enemy. With line of sight it can get a little bit complicated. I would recommend just using good judgment on the on this, but some specifics. It's determined by drawing a straight line from anywhere in the zone of a firing unit to anywhere in the zone of a targeted unit. Say that as long as line of sight is maintained, units can fire across diagonal zones. The way the rules were written, the diagonal zone rule made for some wonky situations. And line of sight is affected by the following. Zones are either high or low. That is, they're either atop walls and buildings or they're on the ground. Now units can freely fire from high to low zones and vice versa, and they can even fire over other units if they're firing to a different elevation. For example, if you're firing from the ground level to a unit atop a wall, a unit could fire over the heads of any friendly or enemy units that are between them and the target. Also note that wall zones block line of sight, and units cannot fire into a zone behind a wall or building zone. However, the palisades in zone I and the low walls on the north and west side of zone C can be fired across. However, I specifically say you can't melee across these. Units on these low walls are not considered to be high, so they can't fire over the heads of units that would normally block their line of sight. Units inside a building of a wall zone cannot be fired on by infantry, but they can be fired on by artillery units. 
and units inside a building of a wall zone may only fire into the adjacent zone through that entry arrow for that specific building. For example, units inside a building in zone B could only fire at zones C, J, and L. Obviously, units inside a building of a wall zone can't fire or melee with units that are on top of the wall of the same zone and vice versa. Now, artillery has a range of three zones, and as long as it has line of sight, it can fire into anything in those other three zones. Now, artillery can only fire once per turn as long as the artillery piece is loaded and a cannon crew is present. To determine the results of an artillery fire combat, you consult the artillery fire ch chart, and you note the number of zones from the artillery unit to the target zone. You roll a die, and you cross-reference the die roll with the range. This is the total number of strength points that are immediately eliminated on the enemy unit by that particular artillery fire. Also, a little rule I have is that the Texian's 18-pounder gets a plus two on its rolls. Uh, this kind of makes that uh, gun a little special. Artillery can also fire into zones that contain units from both sides. However, the friendly units that occupy the target zone must take the same damage as the enemy units that occupy that zone. Now, infantry fire works a lot like artillery fire. It's allowed once per turn, and as long as you have line of sight, the Texian infantry and leaders can fire up to two zones. The Mexican infantry can fire one zone, and they can fire along diagonals. Now, if units from both sides simultaneously occupy a zone, they can't fire on enemy units within that very same zone, although they can fire at units outside that zone as long as they have line of sight. Now, Mexican units can't scale a wall and then immediately conduct an infantry fire in that turn. However, if they're unsuccessful in scaling the wall, they can fire. Cannon crew units that are not firing, loading, or moving artillery units may act as infantry units during infantry fire combat. So basically, as long as they're not manipulating a cannon, they can fire. Now, infantry fire is resolved using the infantry fire chart. And note there are two different charts based on whether it's a Mexican or a Texian player firing. You then select the target zone, and you total the number of strength points firing into the target zone and locate that number of strength points on the infantry fire chart. You roll a die, and you cross-reference the die total thrown with the number of strength points firing, and the number shown at the cross-reference box is the number of strength points immediately eliminated from the targeted zone. Now, an individual unit can't split its fire between two different zones. Units in a zone may split their fire between different zones However, different units in a zone can split their fire between different zones. Now, when you eliminate units, there are Texian and Mexican lost tracks located on the game board, although I find it easier to place units in the eliminated unit box and tally up the total losses at the end of the game for victory point determination. Now, in addition to fire combat, there's melee combat. Uh, that's basically hand-to-hand -hand combat. And units, both Mexican and Texian, can enter zones occupied by an enemy unit. However, if they do, they have to engage in melee combat with each other during the melee phase. Now, the Mexican player can also initiate melee into zones that they're adjacent to. And this is not diagonal, but adjacent. Melee into adjacent zones is optional, and if the Mexican player doesn't initiate it, the Texian player in the adjacent zone may not initiate melee back. Units are only allowed to melee once per turn, and since it's considered simultaneous combat, strength point losses are not applied until both players have had their opportunity to conduct an attack. Units that have scaled a wall can also melee in the same turn that they've climbed that wall, and they can melee in either the zone that they climbed into or into an adjacent zone. Mexican and Texian Units may not, during that turn, leave a zone if an enemy unit moves into that zone and chooses to melee with them. However, in the movement phase of the next turn, they can leave that zone. If a Mexican player melees into an adjacent zone and eliminates all the Texian units in a zone, they can then immediately advance into the zone that they've conquered, if they wish, although they can't melee again during that turn. And if any defending units survive a melee, then all attacking units involved are moved back into the zone from which they came from. And this includes units that have scaled wall zones, so they would immediately be forced off the wall. Now, those units could uh, try to rescale the wall, but they would again have to reroll for a successful scale attempt. Melee combat's resolved by each side totaling how many strength points they have in a zone where the melee is occurring, and that includes both within the zone itself and any adjacent zones. And each player then consults the melee chart. They compare the total number of strength points meleeing, and then they roll a dice. And the die number thrown is cross-referenced on the chart with the total number of strength points 
involved, and this indicates how many enemy strength points will be eliminated. Now, while reloading cannon crews cannot use fire attacks, they can melee with any enemy units that enter their zone. Uh, they cannot melee with units that are in adjacent zones. Meleeing into a building is a little bit different. Only eight strength points can be in a building, and only eight strength points may melee into that building. And also remember that the only zones that you can melee through on buildings are the ones that have the entry arrows. Finally, I've changed up the artillery reload phase a little bit. The theory behind this is that it requires one complete turn to reload an artillery piece after it's been fired. And reloading can only be done by Texian cannon crews or Mexican infantry that are also stacked with a leader. So basically in a turn when artillery is fired, you place a fired marker on it. And at the end of that turn, you replace the firing marker with a reloading marker. The reloading marker then stays on the gun for the next turn, and at the end of the next turn, the reloading marker is taken off. The gun's considered loaded, and then it can fire in the next turn. Now, during the reloading turn, a loading unit has to start its movement on the gun and remain with the gun for the entire turn. And the loading unit may not move or fire. However, they can melee with enemy units that are attacking them. Something a little different in the rules is that I allow cannon crews to also spike guns. And spiking is treated like a reload. It takes one turn to perform, but at the end of that time it renders the gun inoperable and the gun is eliminated from the game. Now units that are stacked with leaders can rally. This is kind of a healing that they do. And for the Mexican player, the units they rally must belong to their column. Rally occurs at the end of each turn as listed in the sequence of play and occurs from turns one through seven. Now after turn seven, there's no rally for either player. Only one strength point can be rallied per leader. Not one rotation, but one strength point. So a 10 strength point unit that is now down to 8 strength points cannot be rallied. The Texians may rally up to 2 strength points per turn, one for Travis and one for Crockett. And the Mexicans may rally up to 4 strength points per turn, one for each column leader that starts the game. Note that a Mott will not be able to rally units due to the breakdown of the uh, strength points within his units. So I'm just mentioning a Mott in his reserve column. Uh, reserve column rules are pretty easy. Starting on turn 3, you roll a dice at the uh, beginning of the turn. You consult the uh, reserve column table. So on turn 3, if it's, if you rolled a 6, then a Mott would come in. On turn 4, if it was a 5 or more, a Mott would come in, and so on. And when the reserve column comes in, the Mexican player places the column on the board in the zone that they listed at the start of the game. Now in the actual Battle of the Alamo, the Mexican's goal was to eliminate the Texian defenders as quickly as possible while minimizing their losses. The Alamo defenders realized that they were going to be eliminated, so during the battle they basically tried to sell their souls at a cost to the Mexican army that would disrupt their future campaigns. And there are a number of opportunities to gain victory points during the game. First of all, the Mexican player has a number of location victory points. They gain two victory points for capturing a wall zone by the end of turn six. If they don't capture a wall zone, in other words, they don't end a turn with a unit on a wall zone, by turn 7 or 8 they get a victory point, and if it's turn 9 or later, they get zero victory points for capturing wall zones. If the Mexicans capture the Alamo Chapel, they get three victory points if done by the end of turn 8, two victory points if done by the end of turn 9 or 10, and one victory point if they capture it by the end of turn 11, and otherwise nothing. Now if they capture El Cuartel, that's zone B, they get one victory point if they do so by the end of turn 9, otherwise zero. Points for capturing locations is only awarded once. At the end of the game, the Mexican player receives one victory point for every eight Texian strength points eliminated, and you round this down. The Texian player receives one victory point for every ten Mexican losses, again rounded down, at the end of the game. At the end of the game, look at the victory point track, and if it's a plus three or greater, then it was a Mexican decisive victory. If it was a plus one or two, it was a Mexican marginal victory. If it was zero, it was a draw. If it was a minus one or minus two, it was a Texian marginal victory. And if it was a minus three or less, it was a Texian decisive victory. All in all, this is a pretty easy game to run. Let's go ahead and do a playthrough. We've got the game set up here, and we'll start with the Mexican player deciding where they want to send their units. And uh, I'm just going to say that Duke's going to send his to two. Uh, we'll say that uh, Romero is going to send his to uh, three. No, four. Let's see, what's down here? One. Okay, let's stay with one. Kaz and Morales will uh, come in on four. So we'll just do that. I think for the uh, Mexican player, I will uh, try hard to get across this palisade here. 
Um, the problem with coming in on three is I've got to cross this rough terrain, and then I've got to leap over this wall on these compounds, and then i got to get through the uh, outer wall buildings here, which I can do fairly easily, but that's a lot of turns that I have to be monkeying around. What I've noticed in the past is usually things get constricted here uh, in zone J pretty quickly. Uh, this little zone in I is pretty much the easiest place to cross. Uh, zone 2, um, I think I'm going to put most of Duke's units down here. Uh, Romero will take the south wall. At least that will distract the uh, Texians a little bit. And 4, and 4. And then we'll put, uh, we'll delete these. We'll put a mock. He'll come in on... I think I'm going to soften things up a little bit. We're going to come with a Mott in on zone. Uh, where should I put him now? I'll put him down here in zone 1. That's where that reinforcement will come. I'm going to pop these guys apart real quick here. I think that's easiest. The one problem with this game, the way it is, is, again, zone 19 and uh, I will get pretty jammed up with uh, pieces, so you're going to have to... Kind of bear with me there. Okay, those guys are all spread out. Duke will go ahead and uh, spread him out a little bit. Is that it? That's everybody. And Romero. Okay, now the Texians can place their units. Let me get rid of these. Sorry, this video. My videos are getting longer and longer. I. If you don't like that, let me know. I'll see what I can do to shorten them down a little bit. I kind of get carried away. Kind of dumb on my part. So let's go ahead and we'll place uh, the guns. I want that 18. I want to use that 18 pounder. And uh, we'll. So we've basically got walls on the north and south. Uh, or we've got guns on the north and south walls. I'll then put a uh, few Texas regiments over here. I think I'll put Crockett over on this palisade. And we're going to put um, the Mobile Grays over here with Travis. And then down on the south wall, I'll keep some guys down here on the south wall. I think I'll put these guys here and this guy here. Okay. So that's the first, uh, that's the setup. We go to first turn. Now, the Mexican setup is considered their uh, turn. So we move on. I've just got the little sequence on the notepad here. I wonder if I pull this down just a little bit here. There we go. Much better. Okay, so the Texian player may move any or all the eligible units. Well, we don't have to move. Um, and then they're going to conduct fire. The Texian player will conduct fire. So they get a free round of fire. Don't feel too sorry for the Mexican units. I have never had the Texians ever even coming close to winning this game of any sort or killing enough points. So I would say that the the Texians would have to be very lucky with die roll and maybe be really cagey, a lot more cagey than I am in order to win this game. Um, I think I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till the... Uh, Units get a little closer, the Mexican units, before I fire. So we're going to hold fire. And so that's the end of the Texian fire round. Melee, no melee, no rallying because nobody's lost anything. We don't have to worry about any sort of markers for artillery. We don't even adjust the VP markers. So, okay, that's the end of round one. Turn one, turn round, not round one. Okay, now the Mexicans can move. And Duke is going to move. He can carry 10 guys with him. So 10 strength points rounded down. It's going to be 8. That's the best he can. He's going to move his 2 and get down hunkered under the wall. The rest of these guys can all move 1. And um, on the south side, Romero can do his 2. Um, all he can move is a lonely 6. These guys will move down. Okay, and then Morales will move his 10. He's got an 8 he can move, so he'll move up to the wall. Kaz will move up to the wall. 1, 2. Now, I, 
You say you can move diagonally and you can fire diagonally. You cannot uh, melee diagonally. Well, anyway, one, two, it wouldn't matter. And let's see. So he says an eight that he can move with him. I'll say these guys can move one, two, three, four. All these guys will basically be moved in this zone. Okay. Those guys have moved. Everybody has moved here on turn two. The Mexicans have. They can then fire. And so uh, I'm going to say Aldama is going to fire here with his eight and eight. And we pull up the Mexican infantry fire chart. Eight and eight is a 16. So the two of them are firing. And we roll a d6, and we get a 6. Okay, so they actually eliminated one Texian unit. Doesn't really matter, so we will lose a step here. Okay, on the south side, because the Mexicans only can fire across one, so they're going to fire up on the wall here with 6, which is not enough. If you look at the Mexican infantry fire, 6 points is not enough to uh, make a fire. And now eight on this uh, north side can they get a two and they get that's a zero so they don't do any sort of damage. Okay, that's it for the Mexican movement point. They can't melee across yet. Oh, I forgot. Oh, they can't climb because they have to start their turn to climb. So they ended their movement in these, so they can't climb next to the walls. Okay, we go to double check our sequence of play here. Texian player, move all eligible units and fire. Okay. So we start with artillery fire. And let's just go ahead and start with the 18-pounder. Now, I said the 18-pounder has a plus two. I just like to give the artillery a little bit of change up. So he's firing across one, two zones. Um, now, I don't think the lunette, he's down on the ground level. So that... He could fire at these guys. I think I'll I'll do that. I think I'll fire down at this Matamoros one here. So I, dial, I roll one, I get a six. So easily that eliminates four. So loose step, loose step. Okay. And he has fired. So you see the little star there. Uh, then we will let uh, Robinson and the Lunette go. Gets a one. So that does one damage. And I was firing into this zone. I should have announced that first, but that's okay. So since it's one and um, the Mexicans will lose two steps because they don't have a single strength point step loss there for that unit. Okay, I'll say the Palisade will go and he will fire into zone nine. And gets a one. So one, I think as a Mexican player, I will take... Um, who do I get? Should I get rid of this guy or should I... I think I'll take a step loss on this guy here. Okay. Now up on here, I'm firing into zone nine from atop the Alamo. I get a three. That's into, that's, now that's one zone. And a three is two. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll lose one step there. Now, remember this is strength point losses, not step losses. Man, if you went with step losses, this thing would be a bloodbath. Okay, I think that's the artillery. I gotta make sure I remember they fired. And then out on this wall, there's nobody here that can fire this uh, gun here on F, but Sergeant Hersey can fire the uh, North Battalion. I'm gonna fire down on Duke in 15. And I roll a uh, four. And for an artillery fire, a four is three step law, or three. Strength point losses. And since I was firing in 15, I'll go loose step. And I've got to take three. That was two points, strength points. I've got to lose another step here. So, whoop. Loose step. Loose step. So, there I'm down to four strength points. 
Okay, that is it for the artillery fire from the Texians. Um, now the uh, Texians can use their uh, infantry fire. So again, we'll start up on the Alamo. They're going to fire down again on, on Zone 9. And they get 2-4. This guy won't fire because he's busy with the cannon. So... Uh, Mexican, Texian infantry fire. There we go. So four to six, we roll a one. So that's nothing. Okay, then we're firing across the Palisades, and they get a two, three, four, five, and Crockett gives them a six. We roll a five, and so that's a loss of one. Um, I'll, again, I'll try to take it. I don't want to eliminate the, as a Mexican player, I don't want to eliminate those units, but... Okay, nothing here, nothing here. Okay, down on here, these guys can fire down on Romero's men. So they've got a 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, and they roll a 2. So 11 and 2 is a 1 unit loss. And then over here on the north side, I got a 4, 8, 12, 13 with Travis. And we get a 6. Ooh, 4 unit loss. Okay, that means we eliminate that unit. Okay. Is that it? That is it for the Texians' fire phase. That was pretty deadly to the, the Mexican player. Okay, then the Texian players move. They fired. Melee occurs. Now, can't melee across this little palisade here, and you can't melee up a wall. Now, you can melee from the top of a wall down into the interior, because, again, all these ramps and ladders and everything were here. Plus, the guys can just jump down. So, I think melee is done. We then remove the fired markers and change that out to the loaded markers. And so, what I do is I take the fired off and I put this inner building arrow on there. That works pretty well with, with this uh, particular vassal module. This guy did a pretty good job on the vassal module. Only thing I wish was it had some notes. It had that note field because I could put my little custom sequence of play in there. Okay, fired and inner building, and then fired and inter building. Okay, so I've indicated that all the cannons have fired. We then rally. Uh, cost can rally a one, but this is two, so cost can't rally. It, there's two strength point step in here, so he can't rally that unit. Uh, Morales can't do the same thing there. Okay. Um, Crockett, I think Crockett can rally. Oh, this guy's up here. Did I put him down? Yeah, we're going to put him in the Palisades, so we'll just assume he's in there. Add step. Okay, so he's rallied. Travis can rally, but there's nobody to rally. And Duke, there's nobody there. Romero can rally because it's a one-step loss, so he adds a step. That's the rally phase. Okay, we go to turn three. First thing we do in turn three is see if the reserve units come in. And uh, you can add modifiers based off of Mexican losses. I don't think it adds anything to the game. Um, if anything, the Texian player has a hard enough time trying to make some victory points, so I just ignore that rule. But I do get a five, so that's not enough for the reserve column to come in on turn three. So we go with the Mexican movement. Um, out here on this wall, all these guys can come rolling across. On the south wall, these guys can come rolling across. I'm going to separate this out because Romero's going to try to oop that guy up onto the wall. Okay, let's see if we can oop him. Um, it's one unit, and they are opposed. So we roll a... Uh, I like this because it says Zulu Melee Mexican Wall Scaling, but this obviously came from the uh, similar Victoria Cross game. So it's just one dice, and it's a three. So one unit with a three is unable to climb that wall. But, so we'll put him over here now, because he can fire and act normal. Okay, over here, Koss has his guy here. One unit, and he tries to scale with a one. Not going to make it. Morales. One unit tries to scale with a three, not going to make it. Okay. 
So that, oh, and then, so we can start really moving guys in here. And like I said, this gets really crowded really fast, so. Okay, so Mexican units have moved. They're going to attempt fire now. So let's get the hardest part out of the way first. And I'm going to just say that all of these units are in uh, this zone 19, but I'm going to pull them out so they I can work with them a little better. And we'll say this guy in J is in zone 19 too. Okay. So we can fire. Should they fire? I think they're going to just put all their fire in on, well, 4, 8, 12, 13, 14. Um, Mexican infantry fire. 14. That's on that low one. So let's go. Yeah, let's pour all our fire on the, the guys that are defending that palisade. So we've got a 6, 12, 18. Actually, let's go. 6 times 6 is 36, 37, 38. 39, 40, 52. Okay. Man, if we would have had two more. We roll a four. So 52 with a four is a one point loss. Feels like you should really be able to do more with that. Okay. The uh, Romero is going to attempt to fire up one, two, three, four, five. So 30 points. And a 30 with a 3 is going to be a point loss here. And then out here, Duke, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, a 36. He just barely makes that and gets a 2. So it's a point loss here. Um, okay, that was the fire phase. Uh, there's no uh, melee phase because nobody's up on top of the walls. So it goes to the Texians. Oh, I forgot to, at the end of the turn, I forgot to take off these uh, inner buildings. So that means that the uh, artillery are now loaded again. So they can fire. So I guess the Texian, do we want to move anywhere? I don't think so. I think we'll continue to defend where we're at. But we do want to use those artillery attacks. So we'll start with, I, I like to use the 18-pounder first. It's fun to use. So we're going to roll a plus a six. So again, an eight, and that was a zone of one, two zones. Artillery zones, and I got a, so we got three, a loss of three. So we'll just lose step. Actually, we'll just take it all out of that one unit. Okay, put him for a fire. Okay, Robinson and the lunette will go. And he's got a, that's actually going to be, I think it's one. You could actually use that little loop there. So we will. Three. Three and one. Two. Okay. Um, we'll just eliminate this guy. And we will put a fired. And then um, the palisade will go. They get a six. Ooh, four. Okay, eliminate this guy. I've never seen the Texians do this well in this game. So they're, at least right now, they're hot. Uh, then one point from the uh, chapel. They get a six, another four. Gee, many Christmas. Okay. Loose step, loose step. Okay, these down to four. And then out here, the North Battalion will fire down. And they get a one. So they do a point of damage to Duke. Um, let's see, lose a step. Okay, everybody's fired that can fire. Oh, now, oh yeah, the Texians have to do um, infantry fire now. So they've got, we'll start up on the chapel, and they've got four points. So four points up on the chapel. We roll a three. That's a one point loss, okay? Step. Um, three, four, five, six points that are firing across the palisades. 
That's a two and nothing there. Okay. Down here, three, six, nine, ten. Ten points firing down with a five. Two points. Okay. Hmm. Let's just lose a step and lose a step. And then finally here on the north wall, four, eight, twelve. Uh, twelve with a two is a one point loss. Lose a step. Okay, that's the, the Texians have fired. Okay, so we're moving into the rally phase, and let's just work our way around. Let's start with the Texians. Crockett is going to add a step to the Texan, Texas Regional Legion. Koss will add one. Morales will add one to his badly mauled units. Uh, down on the south wall, Romero will add one. And then Duke will add one out on the north wall. I said south wall, that's the... Is that the west wall? Anyway. I, uh, one of my pet peeves with games is not having north at the top of a map. I, that's always driven me kind of crazy. So that's just, again, a little pet peeve. Okay, and then we're going to start loading our cannons again. So we'll spend the round loading cannons. It's getting still cold out there. I'm just kind of surprised here. It's the end of March and we still have the heat running away. So hopefully it'll be nice in the next couple of weeks. It usually does. It gets nice pretty quick here and then it gets hot. So by the middle of May, it's, things are kind of hot. That's the downside to living out on the prairie. Okay, I think that's it. We can go to turn four. Oh, Travis. Did Travis take any? Yeah. There. There we go. Now we're on turn four. Uh, tra so we got to check to see if the reserves come in. And we need to roll the dice. And we get a two. So, nope, the reserves are still out. Okay. Then... Mexico player can move units, and so they're going to try to climb walls. Uh, we'll start with Kaza's units here. I think everybody is in, in zone 19, so once they can get across, they can start to really hit the Texians with some melee combat that will reduce them quickly. Um, but we need to check and see... Oh, there we go. If um, Mexican wall scaling, okay. We get a one. How many units? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven tried to cross. And we rolled a three. So that leaves two units that can get across. And what I do is I just put this little hide here. I want the toughest units up here to indicate that they are sitting on top of the walls, bitterly fighting the uh, Texians. There's two units for Morales. Um, we roll a five and get a one. So one of these guys gets to go across. We definitely want the four to try to do it. So they won't give, be able to fire this round, but they'll be able to, uh, or this turn, but they will be able to melee. Okay, uh, down here, Romero, he has one, two, three, four, five. And we roll a five, five and five. Two units get up here on top of the wall. Uh, hide it and hide it. And then out with Duke. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we roll a two. A six and a two is a two. Two will get up on top of the wall. And two. Okay. Now we can go with the uh, Mexican fire phase. So over in zone 19, I think we will again, again try to soften up the uh, palisade so we've got 10 16 18 24 26 okay so mexican infantry fire at 26 and we roll a five and we get a one so they take a one point loss okay down here we've got 6 12 18 we do a six so again a one point loss here and then out on the north wall, we've got a 6, 12, 24. 
with a six. Man, they're rolling hot. Okay, 24 and six. That's a two point loss. Okay, let's go ahead and just get rid of this, eliminate this unit. And so that was the uh, Mexican fire phase. Next, the Texians can go. Um, I think what I am going to do is we are going to flee. And we can flee two with uh, Travis. And we are going to duck into those barracks here, the long barracks in D. Okay. Down here, I think they will stay put on the wall and fight. Um, Crockett could move back, but I think we'll continue to fight. Yeah. Crockett is going to take a unit and move one two into b the long barracks here and i think that's going to be it for move okay now we can go to fire now no artillery can fire this round but uh, we can fire down here I'm going to say we are going to try to fire on these meleeing units. Um, these outside the zone can. They can fire out here. One of the, they can. Um, pretty sure they can. I don't know. It's hard to say. Can they melee just out or can they fire? I think they can actually fire out. So, so we have four, one, two, and they can fire. Yeah, you know, it's going to be hard to hit these guys. I don't think that's going to work. So. Two, they could fire over here. One, two, no, that's too far off. Wait, one, two units. Yeah, they can fire over here. Okay. I must say they fire out the door, and these guys will fire out the door. So we have a three, four, five, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. We're trying to hit these guys on top of the wall. So, um, Texians are firing with. 13 and they get a 1. It ain't going to matter really. 13 and a 1 is a 0. So nothing there. Okay. Um, these guys here will try to attempt to fire with 2, 4, 5, 6. Um, and they get a 4. That's 1 that the Mexicans will take. Uh, let's see here. Let's just reduce this one. And then down on the uh, west wall, four, six, seven, eight, nine, and we roll a three. That's one. I will also one. New step. Okay. Duke. Nobody's going to be firing on them. I will abandon reloading. Well, ones. I can get a four, five, and six and eliminate one of those guys. They're pretty much going to take me out here, I think. Um, yeah, we'll do that. So we roll a d6 and get a three, so nothing. So Hersey's not going to be able to do much. Okay, that's it for the uh, Texian uh, fire phase. We go to the melee phase, first melee phase in the game. So we can flip these guys. And they've got a uh, they got a ten, and the Texians have a two and a three. These guys melee; they can keep loading and meleeing. So a three against a ten. Okay. So we'll start with the uh, let's start with the Mexicans, and they get a three a ten with a three. So the Texians will lose one, and the Mexicans with a one. Uh, let's see, they had a three. To a five. So one and one. Each side loses one. Loose step. Loose step. Okay. So they are now in the same zone. Oh, I forgot these guys. How much would it? These guys should have been able to fight in there. That's okay. 
again, I'm not too worried that it's going to change the game up a lot, but... Ah! There we go. Okay. I think these guys were... Okay, so they got 11 and a 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 11 to 9. Okay, so the Mexicans will go 11 with a 2 is a one point loss and a nine with a four is a one point loss. Okay, both sides take a one point loss. Okay, they're on top of the wall. Okay, and then out here. Up. There we go. Oh, I didn't get the toughest guys here. That's okay. An eight and a one. Okay, let's go with the Texians first. They get a six. So the Mexicans will lose one, and the Mexicans with an eight get a a five. So they easily take out this. They eliminate this one here, but they do take a point of damage. And there we are. Okay. Okay, that was the end of the melee phase. Uh, we can uh, show any uh, cannons that are loaded. This one's loaded. I'm going to say they did load it, so the Mexicans could use that to their advantage. And, okay, and in a rally phase, um, Crockett can't do much. This guy's at full strength. Travis... His units are at full strength. Okay. Romero can add one. Duke can't. Well, these guys are up on top. And I said Duke can move up and down the ladders. So he can add a step. Morales uh, can add a step. And Koss can add a step. Okay. That is the end of turn five. Or no, turn four. Okay. We go into the uh, next. Reserve entry, turn five, we roll, and we get a three. My gosh, they're not making it. Okay, so they didn't make it in. Okay, we go to the Mexican movement phase, and we'll start to see if, if Koss can oop some guys over the wall here. Um, he's got five units to cross and two. That's one guy gets ooped. Okay, we'll just... Take the first guy. We're going to take him at random. He gets ooped, and um, one for Morales has a one, so he can't oop anybody. Romero goes with three units and a five. Three units and a five is a one, so one guy gets ooped. Duke has nobody up on the wall. There's no Texians on the wall, so he rolls 2d6. He's got four units. We roll 2d6 and get a six. And that's two units can get up on the wall. Okay. Then we can move units. Okay, these guys are going to all sit in here and fight. I think that guy was up on the wall. Oh, well, we'll just assume he was for melee purposes. Um, they can fire. Oh, they got to move first. Okay, any other guys can move. Okay, these guys will move so they can melee against those guys in here. These guys will fight on the wall. These guys will fight on the wall. Okay, let's start with... Um, Let's start with our uh, firing from the Mexican standpoint. So these guys are going to fire at 4. 6 is 10. And 6 and 6 is 12. So 22. Um, 22 with a 2. Is it nothing? Okay. These guys cannot fire because um, these guys are hunkered down. We go over here, and these guys that are on top of the wall can't fire, but they can melee. But outside the wall, they can. However, they're going to do damage to 
any friendly units, that's okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and try to fire on these guys. So we get a 2, 4, 10, 16, 22. We roll a 1. 22 and 1 is 0. So, okay, they no friendly fire, nothing there. Now the Texians can go. Okay, the Texians are going to try to blast these guys. Let's start with the 18-pounder, and it's one, two away. We roll a four. Actually, that's a six because of the plus two with the 18-pounder, so they take three. Um, One, two, he's eliminated, and one. Lose a step. Okay. Robinson in the lunette gets to go. Gets a two, and a two on a, gets a two damage, so we'll eliminate a unit. Uh, the guy here gets to go on the palisade. Gets a two and a two, so that's gonna lose step and lose step. Okay, and then the chapel guy gets to go. I better put these are fired, 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 and the chapel will go. The chapel goes with a one and one, so these guys lose another step. Okay, nothing here, nothing here. I think that's all the guns that can fire. Okay, then the um, Texians will go with a Texian fire phase. Um, Going to shoot down, try to get these guys that are coming in. So two and a four. And then they'll there's a five. So they get a five on the Texian fire phase. They get a six. Oof, two. So two more go. Loose step, loose step. Uh, down on the west wall, a four, five, six, seven, eight, and a six, an eight with a six. It's a three, okay. Loose step, loose step, loose step, and. Then they firing out of the barracks here. Travis has a nine. And they get a three. A nine with a three. And there are eight units here. Travis doesn't count for the uh, stacking here. So oh, it said eight with a three. Eight with a three is one point. Loose step. Okay, I think that's everybody. Crockett. Can he fire on the wall? One, two. He can. So Crockett's going to fire up on the wall with four. A four and a four. They lose another step for the guys up on the wall. But since they're firing into a zone with friendly units, the friendly units have to take one. So, well, we'll just do that to show what happens. Okay, we probably shouldn't have done that, but that's okay. Okay, now we can go around to our melee. Everybody's up on the wall here. We are going to take these guys off. Okay, we'll start up here at the Palisade again. They got a 4, 6, 10, 14, 18. And uh, so the Mexicans are going to melee with 18. And they get a four. That gonna ki that's going to kill two units. Okay, that's enough to, to eliminate those guys. However, they still get, the Texians still get two, and they get a five. Okay, a five with a two is one. So eliminate and eliminate. Oh, I forgot to give them a. Since they got up on the palisade, they got on the wall by turn seven, they get a victory point. Okay. So the Mexicans are now up on top of the wall. And 
We may lay down here. We got seven points for the Texians and 11 points for the Mexicans. So Mexicans will go first with a two. They're going to take one, and then the Texians will go with a four, and that's one. So we eliminate one from each side. Up on the north wall, nobody there. And then down in the plaza, uh, the Mexicans have a seven, the Texians have a nine. Okay, let's go with the uh, Mexicans with a seven, and they get a six. Ooh, three. Okay. So the Texians will take three, the Mexicans will take um, a one, nothing. Okay. Loose step. Loose step, loose step. Things are starting to fall apart for the Texians here. It's, it will, they'll crumble pretty quick in the next couple turns. Okay, that's melee. We then can uh, change up these cannons again. That one won't matter. Now, one thing that isn't addressed in this is whether the cannons can can rotate around and fire into the courtyard. They probably shouldn't, but that's okay. I'm going to say they can. Okay, that's it. Rallying. Um, Crockett, let's see. Travis can rally one. And then uh, Cos can rally one. Morales can rally one. Romero can rally one. And Duke doesn't have anybody to rally, so... Okay, that moves us into turn six. And we are going to go with the reserve unit. We roll a two, so finally the reserve unit makes it in. Let's pull a mot here. I think the battle's going to be over by the time they get into the Alamo. Okay, a mot's going to go one, two. And drag a unit with him. The rest of his minions will be right behind him. And that's his move. Okay, Mexican move over here. Two, three. Um, these guys will move in. These guys will continue to fight on the walls. And then Duke is going to see if Duke can get him more units across. Let's go ahead and see how about getting scaling the walls. It's a six, a nine with two units. There's the two. So he's these guys are on the wall now. Okay, and Duke's up there with them. Okay, Romero can still, he's going to try to get two more units up there. Gets a three. So one guy is able to get up there. Okay, and then... Kaz uh, has one, two, three, four units. Rolls two dice, so four units and six. So two guys get to be up on the wall with Kaz. Hide and hide. And that's it for movement and scaling. We'll say Morales can move in. And, hmm. I'm going to actually keep Morales here with this guy. And we're going to see if we can commandeer that cannon. Okay. Now we move our way around here. He can't fire the cannon yet, but these guys can fire. They're going to fire up on the Alamo. So they have a 10, and then outside has an 8 and a 4. 18, so they'll, we'll see if the Mexicans fire. 18 with a 4. Okay, that's a 4, nothing. Um, these guys can fire. They can actually fire diagonally. Wait, 1, no, they can't. This guy can fire diagonally. So 10 and 15. And these guys can't fire in there, so they're going to fire back on the wall. So let's go wait. Let's go with 10, 15. A 15, 20, 
32, 34. So they're going to fire 34 at the west wall. And uh, they get a 3. So 34 and 3 is 1. So the Texians take a step loss. However, the Mexicans also have to take a step loss since they've got friendly, there's friendly fire is going to get those guys. Okay, that's it for the Mexican. I think that's it for the Mexican fire phase. Okay, we go to the Texian fire phase. And these guys will shoot down two, four, five, six, seven, eight. And Texian eight with four. One point loss. Okay. Um, cannons can't go. These guys can fire five with a two. A five and a two is nothing. And actually, let's make that a five with a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A five with a nine. Nine with a two. There's a there's a point. Okay. Lose turn. Okay, that's it for the fire phase. We then go to the melee phase. So we are flip our guys over. These guys can't do anything. However, these guys can. Okay, the, the Texians have a 5, 10, 18, and 6. Okay, that's four points the Mexicans will take. And, um, or the Texians will take that. And then the five for the Texians, a five and a one, nothing. So they take four. Loose step and eliminate. There's two. Loose step and eliminate. There we go. Okay. One guy left on that west wall. These guys are going to attack Crockett in the building. So they've got five and a nine to a four. I think I said eight's the maximum number in, so... Well, that doesn't really matter, so... Okay, Tex the Mexicans will fight into the building on Crockett. They get a six. That's a three-point loss that Crockett will take. And so he'll eliminate the Texas regulars, and then the Texas regulars will also get a fight simultaneously. We get a four and a four, so the Mexicans will take a point loss. Step and eliminate. Okay, that's it for melee. And then we go through and we can take our inner buildings off. Everybody reloads, and we don't have to roll again to see if reserves came in. Cannons are ready to go. Crockett doesn't have anybody he can help out. Travis does, so Travis will add a step. Duke, he's not down with these guys yet. Romero can add a step. And also, I don't think Amat can actually rally. He also can't rally after turn four. Sure. Let's see here. These guys can add a step. Okay. Now we move into turn seven. This is the last turn where we can gain bonuses for entering buildings, but that's not going to make a big difference. Let's start with the Mexicans attacking. One, two, Duke's going to go here, and he can actually attack. I can't take place. He can. I'm going to say he can actually attack there. And he's going to bring... He can't bring anybody with him. Okay, these guys can definitely fire up on this guy. So the guys on the north are going to fire up on the west wall. Uh, we're going to see if Romero can alley-oop his guy up. So he gets a three and a four. Uh, for one unit, nothing. Okay. A mot. And these guys got to move in here, so then a mot can try to alley-oop his boys over. 
six, and you get a roll twice, so four, five. We got six and five. Two, two units can get up here. Okay. These guys are firing. These guys are gonna fire. These guys are all in. So they will fire, some will fire to the Alamo. Oh, they can fire with the cannon. Oh, Koss has to alley-oop these two guys. Okay, two units, five and three, eight. So these guys both make it in. Hide solitaire and hide solitaire. There we go. And we'll say Koss is now in. Okay, everybody has moved. Now we can try to shoot. I am going to try to shoot across this palisade gun um, to the lunette. Let's try to do the lunette first. And so that's a one range and a four. So that automatically takes out Robinson. And we have this gun is fired. That's the only gun. Okay, then these guys are going to shoot up on the roof. Now they can do this in melee, so he's with Morales. Okay, so five, four, eight, twelve, seventeen. They had just one more. Two, nothing. Okay. Can't fire in. Oh, these guys. Let's go. Seven, seventeen. Okay, ten, twenty, thirty-four. And can't make that. He can't make that shot. Can make that shot down here. So they got thirty-four. They're going to try to take out Carry in the eighteen-pounder. Uh, thirty-four. They get a six. Yep, they do. Okay, the 18 pounder has been. It's loaded though. Okay. Down here we have six and five and six. Oh, he's in that same zone. Okay. So we have six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 34, 35, 36. Okay, they're going to fire with 36, and they get a 4. 36 and 4 is one point that the, these guys take, so it'll eliminate the Texians. However, the uh, Mexican player also has to, whoops, they have to take one friendly fire. So, lose a step here. Okay. Texians get to move and fight. Okay, they can fire out, so we'll start, actually, let's start up here on the, on the, uh, roof of the chapel and fire down on these guys. So we'll have an artillery fight and we roll a two and they have to lose two. Step. Okay. So now this guy's fired. That's the last of the artillery. Okay. We can try to rain some terror down out of this. So we've got two, four, five for Crockett, and we get a three. So they lose another step. Okay. Uh, they want to lose this one. Okay. No, uh, Travis is still over here. One, uh, seven, eight. With a one, eight and one, nothing. Okay. They then go to melee. And so we're basically with these guys in their little hubby cubby holes, we can only use eight to melee in. And so we're gonna say eight to the chapel. 8 to Crockett, and 8 to Travis. Okay, let's start with the uh, chapel. So our 8 to the chapel is a 3. 
8 to the chapel is a 3. So the chapel loses 1. Loose step. Oh, okay. And then they had 2 and 4. 5. And a 3. A 5 and a 3. So then the Mexicans will lose a step 2. Okay. Oh, they got a 16. No, wait. So we had 8 here to fight against Crockett. 8 and then 6. So that's 14. Because there's actually two entrances. So 14 against Crockett is a 5. That's going to be enough to take Crockett out. And then Crockett fights back with a 5. And takes one guy down. He goes down fighting. Okay, and then Travis, we have 8 going in and 8 coming out. 8 going in is a 5 and 1. 8 going out is a 4 and 1. So, And that's it for the melee turn. Okay, Travis can bring one guy back. Uh, Duke can bring a guy back. Uh, Romero is up on the wall, so he can bring a guy back. These guys can't. Um, how about... Yeah, down here he can. And Koss can bring a guy back. Those are kind of deadly. Okay, end of turn. Let's uh, take off the fired. And the fired. And we'll put enter building and enter building. And Amat will jump on the wall, and we will we will move that cannon one. Actually, he can get up there and fire. Let's see, one, two, three. Yeah, he can fire to the top of the Alamo. Let's try that. Ah, let's see. Wait, he can get on the 18er. Yeah, I think we can do that. Okay, got a plan here that in this turn, did I move my marker? I'll move it again. That's okay. Oh, he moved in by by eliminating Crockett. You moved in, so they get a point for that. Okay, so now we can do this. Um, Mott's going to move. And this guy's going to move. Actually, we're going to move the five guy. He'll move down to one. Um, these guys will move with Duke. Um, no, they're going to move here. Because they can fire this guy. Okay. These guys will move their cannon. And Romero. And they're going to blast out this guy. Okay. Amat and this guy are going to fire one, two, three. Three artillery. And they get a six. So they do four damage. So that's two. Eliminate. Three. Eliminate. Four. Eliminate. Okay. Uh, then Romero is going to fight from one zone. Actually, he can move and can't. I don't think you can fire the same. Wait, up on the way. Okay. I'm going to say he has to stay there. He can move and. No, that one is. Was that loaded? It was loaded. So I'm going to say they're going to stay up here. And he can fire down on uh, Travis. That's the last of the Alamo defenders. Duke can fire, and Romero can fire. So they can fire at one, two, a range of two. We roll a, oops, oh, we roll a six. Oh, okay, that's four. So we'll eliminate, a, oops, lose a step. And this guy can fire. Over here, Duke can fire with that uh, redoubt. 
he gets a six and that's enough uh, that's four units so eliminate and eliminate okay so for every eight Texian strength points eliminated the uh, Mexican player gets a victory point so by eliminating all 40 of the units you're going to get 40 divided by eight or five victory points let's put those in up here and so they get five plus two is going to be seven and then you subtract the uh, Texian points and the Texians get a uh, victory point for every 10 Mexican units eliminated and you round down just like the other one so they eliminated 49 Mexican points so they lose so they get uh, four victory points so seven minus four is three so again that's another decisive uh, Mexican victory I have not played this game yet where I didn't get a decisive Mexican victory so probably ought to change the way the victory points are uh, doled out a little bit I don't know it's an okay game I think it has a few issues but at least it's fairly fast and easy to play I think it what, took about an hour to play so I'm pretty much done with the revolution in Texas for now um, it's gonna it feels kind of nice to be able to move on to something else looking over the five games I've played I think they all have a few good things about them Certainly it's an area that most war games don't cover. I think they also have some limitations. If, a, if I was going to rank them, I'd say probably the Vivictus one would probably be my favorite, followed by the SPI Alamo game. I would then probably go with the uh, Texas Revolution that uh, Dan Mings did. It's, it's an okay game. It's got a lot of potential. It just needs a little bit of uh, sanded down the rough edges. I think the this would probably be I think I would rank this probably the fourth game, and then I would probably rank Texas Glory as my least uh, favorite of these games. I just never really warmed up to it that much. I uh, think maybe next year, after I've kind of let the dust settle on these, I might try to come up with an Alamo game just on my own and uh, see how it plays out. But uh, I, right now I need a little bit of break from Texas. That's all I got. Again, thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. And if you have any game suggestions, let me know down below, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.